Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Patricia Meredith and I am an author of Historical Mystery. And my most recent release was the first book in the Anna Catherine Green Mysteries, A Deed of Dreadful Note. Now I am also an author of Historical Mysteries set in Spokane in 1901. And I was lucky enough to live in Spokane when I first began my research for those books. And so I got to do a lot of hands-on research for them. But with this book, Anna Catherine Green, was primarily located on the East Coast. Uh, she was born and raised pretty much in New York City, lived in Buffalo for a long time, moved quite a bit, but primarily on the East Coast. So when I discovered that in order to write future books in this series, I would have to plumb the depths of a couple different museums not located near me because of the research not being available online. And I, trust me, I have found pretty much everything that there is to find about Anna Catherine Green online. And if you want to learn more about that, check out my website at patricia-meredith.com. So along with that, I discovered that there were two main museums that primarily housed the documents that were left by Anna Catherine Green's uh, descendants. And although, as far as I can tell, none of them are still alive, all of her things are now at these two museums. Now, one is in Texas and one is in Delaware. And for those of you who follow me, you know that I am currently located in Colorado. And so it was a big question of when will I ever get a chance to go see these museums and see what they have? I reached out to both of them and both of them immediately replied and have been so helpful to me. And I asked them, you know, can you scan all the things that you have and send them to me? And usually that requires a fee and I'm willing to pay that. But even still, they just don't have the resources to do that. They said, really, the best thing is going to be for you to come in in person. Now, in Texas, there are a lot of the first edition books that she wrote. In fact, including some that you can't even find copies of anymore, not even on Gutenberg. So I'm very excited to check those out eventually. But today, what I am so excited to take you with me on this incredible research trip that I just got to take. My family and I drove across the country. Along the way, we got to see some of our amazing booktube friends at Tori Talks and at Wizardly Reads and Dr. John Morrow, who does a bunch of reviews on Goodreads and at Nico's Book Reviews, all of whom I highly recommend you check out on their channels and on Goodreads for fantastic book reviews. And then we came down to Delaware and we went to the Winterthur Museum. Museum, what I was interested in was discovering that a bunch of the documents and memorabilia that was owned by Anna Catherine Green and her husband, Charles Rolfs, has ended up at this museum. Now, this is primarily because Charles Rolfs would go on to become a very famous furniture designer in his own right. But before that, he was a very famous actor which means there are headshots and playbills from when he was an actor. Well, it turns out all of this is at the Winterthur Museum. So I got to go out there. I got to see Anna Catherine Green's handwriting in diaries. I got to see Charles Rolfe's handwriting in baby books. And I'll get more into that here in a minute. But I want to share with you some of the highlights of what I uncovered there to just whet your appetite for future books in this series. It will be coming along very, very soon. And so I'm very excited to dive into that research and begin planning and considering what is my layout for the remainder of this series. So come along with me and let's see what I uncovered. All right, so this first piece 
is from a journal that was kept by Anna Catherine Green when she and her family went on a trip abroad. And on the very opening flap, I was just so blown away to find these illustrations by her husband, Charles Rolfs. Um, you can see the filigree at the top has the C and the R. And then if you look closely at the drawings, uh, there's a little notation of Macbeth. And so these are some actual axes and swords that they saw while overseas and he sketched them out. And you'll see later in the commentary in the journal itself, he talks about being inspired by these pieces in his reflection of Macbeth. Now, I won't read the entire journal, but the first few pages just to get a taste of what I was able to find. So we have April 21st, 1890, left Buffalo on the DLN something, the children well, pleasant journey, found that it paid to take a stateroom. <laughs> and on the 22nd, she writes, arrived at the continent, all in time for breakfast. Sterling, who is their second born, a trifle ill, probably owing to the excitement. At 10 p.m., Judge Daly called. Later, Louise came in. At 5 p.m., Judge Daly calls again, bringing flowers and candy for the children. 23rd, Louise calls again at 4 p.m. to attend the Players Club, meet somebody, maybe Mr. Gilder, Daisy Smith and Mrs. Fields, in the evening, we go to Daly's Theater, arriving late but getting much enjoyment out of the performance of Rosina Vokes. Friday the 24th, Charles takes children to Brooklyn to see Dr. Moffat, Miss Somebody and Elizabeth. I take lunch with Mrs. Avery at the Fifth Avenue. Annie Dow arrives at the Continental. The children play hard and Rosamond takes cold. Rosamond is her eldest and the only girl. Friday the 25th, a serious day, R, meaning Rosamond, wakes with one of her bad attacks. I take her into my bed, being myself very tired and weak. Give her Epicac and Belladonna. Mrs. Belcher and Hilda call. Great concern for R. Annie Dow does everything. Louise calls again, send for Dr. Gilbert, approves of my treatment. She does not improve. Send for Dr. G again. Comes twice in the night. Very sick child. Annie Dow proves herself an angel of light. Saturday, 26th. Rosamond still ill. Impossible to break up her painful breathing. We nevertheless start for the steamer. No one on board. Find George Stonebridge there. Frank, Louise, Miss somebody, Mrs. Matterson, Sydney and Annie. Rosamond continues ill. We call the ship's doctor and he advises against our sailing. We immediately quit the ship for Orange. Annie taking Sterling in advance. One trunk remains on ship. Dr. Seward prescribes for R. Sunday, the 27th. Rosamond gives her first sign of improvement by thrusting one foot and then the other into my hand. Continues to brighten through the day. Little Saint Cecilia. Saturday, May 3rd. Rosamond being much improved in fact, in her usual health, we leave Orange for the steamship. The journey continues, and of course, I'm not going to reveal everything, because eventually this is going to be the basis for one of the books in my series. Of course, we're going to have to have a murder on the steamship while they're heading overseas, or perhaps they'll get wrapped up in something while overseas. But just a few other pages that I wanted to point out. One of the things that I love finding is ink blots and other evidences of humanity <laughs> in her journals. Uh, I absolutely love her handwriting. It is so beautiful. And then I love that she includes how much it cost 
for different things, so her expenses, and so I'm really looking forward to digging into this journal. I can see right there it says Liverpool, and I know there's some other places that they hit along the way as well. So I'm very excited to look further into this and see where their travels took them. The next thing I came across was a set of baby books, and although this handwriting here in this first one looks to match Anna Catherine Green's, you will see when we open the actual book that the handwriting is very different. And it took me a couple lines before I realized that these baby books were not being written by Anna, the mother, oh no, they are being written by Charles, the father. And that just gives me chills up and down my spine because how often are you going to see that in the past, even in modern day? How often are you going to see the father keeping the baby book rather than the mother? So here we go. On the first page, we have Monday, August 31st, 1885. This morning at 1122 a.m. came unto us a little visitor who Sweetheart says is to be called Rosamond Rolfs. When the little life was placed beside her mother for the first time, she looked out of two deep blue eyes, first at her mother and then at me. What a look! So searching, so full of the right to know what life and her relations to it and us meant. It startled us both for we divined its import. I am a father and my darling wife, a happy mother. We did not know instantly that the little blessing lived and sweetheart hardly out of her pain asked as if her heart would break in a childlike way. Why doesn't my baby cry? Dr. Moffat, R.C., said in reply, she will cry pretty soon. And she did lustily. We cannot tell whether she will most resemble her father or her mother. I am most anxious that she should resemble my Kate. Sweetheart hoped in vain that she would have brown eyes like mine. But if our wee baby continues to grow as her healthy body now gives indication of, how happy we will be with our new found treasure. Rosamond is 18 inches tall. And again, I don't want to give everything away because this will definitely help me to write the book where Anna has her first baby. But as you can see, I just immediately fell in love with Charles, getting to hear how he speaks of his wife, the way he refers to her, the way he views his daughter, and it goes on like that in the diary. Also included are some locks of her hair and little examples of her handwriting like this one where she is practicing writing her name and that just lit up my face so much to see things like that. The next child born would be Sterling Rolfs and so this will be his baby book and once again this is recorded by Charles rather than Anna. And I am not going to read too much from the opening of his book because what I loved most about this book was finding he took after his father with his artistic abilities. And so throughout Sterling's book, there are cuttings and collections of little things that he cut out of newspaper and paper lying around the house into different shapes. And then in the back of the book, I found this incredible letter to Santa Claus. Santa Claus, bring Sterling Rolfs a warship and a cannon and a gun and soldiers to die and a few pictures and a toilet set and a buskin and a little playhouse and a stable, and a few horses, and a something to keep their hay wagon, and a little clock, and a drum, and a sword, and a lantern, and a table, and a wastebasket, and a little washstand, and a toy towel rack, 
and a few towels. What I love is obviously at this point, he started just looking around the room for ideas and was listing off things that he was seeing around the room. And a little play chemistry set and two big dolls and a big bed for my cat and a little bed for my mouse and another little bed for my fish, a little pitcher and towels and soap and cup and saucer, a little engine. I have been a good boy, but that's crossed out. I haven't been very naughty. And a little thing to tell the dot, maybe? That's all. Please look on the other side. <laughs> Please bring the baby a new little rattle and little bells. So that means his little brother has been born by the time he wrote this. If you have only room to bring one thing, bring the warship. <laughs> Sterling dictated this to Mrs. Pitkin, December 8th, 92. I love the last line the most. If you have only room to bring one thing, bring the warship. <laughs> and he even drew the chemistry set. So then we go on to the last baby book and what's really fun about this one is it is one of those stories of where you are gifted a diary one year and you're like I'm gonna start a diary but you never get around to it and then years later after you're married and have kids you go digging for a baby book to make for your last son and you come across this old journal that you never wrote anything in and so you pull it out because as you'll see from this opening inscription it says a present on the anniversary of my 21st birthday from my mother and it's signed by Charles Rolfs. So this was gifted to him on his birthday and then he finally got around to using it with his third child. So again we're going to skip ahead a little bit in this particular baby book and basically a quick summary of the opening of the book is they haven't decided yet what to name the child. So on this page they finally decide on Roland Rolfs and that's what they're going to name him. And right there is a sketch by Charles of what his bassinet is going to look like when he builds it. But the best part of this page is further down at the bottom where Charles writes, I, Rollins' father, am looking forward to going on the stage again, either to star in his mother's dramatization of her first great novel, The Leavenworth Case, or to play in Shakespearean roles. And for those of you who have already read my book or who are interested in reading my book, A Deed of Dreadful Note, that is all about Anna Catherine Green writing that first great novel, The Leavenworth Case. And so Charles goes on to talk about how he's unsure of where they're going to end up and what's going to happen next. So again, just amazing story fodder here and all coming straight out of the mouth of Charles Rolfs, Anna's husband. I then switched gears into discovering some photos and there were tons of photos of furniture created by Charles when he became famous for his furniture designs. And these first two are pieces that are featured in Anna Catherine Green's bedroom apparently. That's how they're labeled on the back. And then there's some photos of her bedroom as well. So that just made me so excited. I could not tell where some of these photos were taken. So I'm not sure which houses they were at. There is some mention of the Park Street address, so I'll have to look further into that and find out for sure. But we've got everything from their living rooms to a friendly cat. So I'm not sure who the cat is. Unfortunately, there's no name for him. So I might get to have a lot of fun coming up with a name for him when he is featured in a future book. So then we got to dive into some photographs of Charles himself. This first one is a photo of him and his two sons. So that would be Sterling is the older one. Roland is going to be the younger one. 
and then there were pictures of Charles in different roles that he played throughout his life and again I'm gonna have to do some further research to figure out what roles these actually were but it's so much fun to see him in these headshots for these roles because it immediately portrays what I have read about him in reviews of his work where it talks about his face was very malleable and comedic and so that is something that I incorporated into the book A Deed of Dreadful Note when he is mentioned and I absolutely intend to play with that more as I write him in future books. And then there were boxes of playbills and as you can see he definitely portrayed a wide variety of characters from Shakespearean plays. He absolutely loved Shakespeare and he never played any leading roles as far as I can see though he does have some notes in certain places of his remarks based off watching other people play which is really entertaining and I really look forward to diving into those more because that is going to make him thinking about you know well when I play Hamlet I would do it this way and just interpreting the role in different ways. And then this final piece is again really close to my heart because it ties directly back into his wife Anna Catherine Green. And you might be wondering, what playbill is this? It just says the play. And it took me a little bit of digging to flip through and find out for sure. But right here is where it was confirmed for me that yes, this is a playbill from opening night of the Leavenworth case, which was Anna Catherine Green's debut novel that made her the famous person that she was when she was alive. And although she may be forgotten today, The Leavenworth Case is still talked about as one of the greatest mystery novels of all time. And not many people know that it was turned into a play. And not only was it turned into a play, but her husband got to play a starring role in it. He got to play the secretary. And so this is a amazing find to be able to hold in my hands the playbill of her original dramatization of her novel and it's just this was a once in a lifetime opportunity you guys to get to go and see all of this and I am so excited to incorporate all of it into future books and to take closer looks at all of this uh, at my leisure over the next couple years. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed looking at some of that just as much as I did. I was so blown away by the things that I was able to uncover at the Winter Theater Museum. And again, I just want to give a great big thank you to the museum, to the people who helped me uncover everything, who allowed me to come in and spend an entire day just taking pictures of all of their memorabilia. And I'm so excited to dive into it, read further, and see what it uncovers for future books in the series, beginning with A Deed of Dreadful Note. So be sure to pick up a copy of this. It is available in ebook, print, and audiobook. Uh, the audiobook is read by me. So um, I would love it if you picked up one of those copies. And then be sure to leave me a review on Amazon or Goodreads so that others know how much you enjoyed the book and the beginning of this new series. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed these little research jaunts. And I look forward to seeing you next time on my channel. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.